Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I have one question to start today. Chiefs or Eagles? If you're a Chiefs fan, raise your hand. If you're an Eagles fan, raise your hand. Oh, it's pretty split. Wow. Okay, tremendous. Welcome to AUSA's Coffee Series featuring the Commanding General of the Army Futures Command, General James Rainey. Thank you for being here. We have a tremendous crowd. Uh, my name is Alex Brody. I am the Director of Meetings here at AUSA. And again, thank you for being here. I would like to thank our four-star sponsors, Leonardo DRS and General Dynamics, as well as our two-star sponsor, Northrop Grumman, for their support of our coffee series. We cannot thank you enough for your continued support over the years. Please give our sponsors a big round of applause. And if anyone is interested in learning more about becoming a sponsor, please reach out to Gay Hudson or Emily Call, our sponsorship team. Emily is out in the registration area, so if you get a chance, feel free to stop by and say hi. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome former AUSA President and CEO, General Carter Ham, who is here with us this morning. <laughs> Sir, great to see you. We appreciate the presence of general officers and command sergeant majors joining us this morning as well. It's always great to have you here. I'd also like to acknowledge congressional staff that are here with us. Your efforts on behalf of the Army, soldiers, and families are greatly appreciated. And with that, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Association of the United States Army. Please welcome General Robert Brown. Thanks, Alex. Well, uh, welcome. Great to have you all here. Uh, and uh, I was uh, impressed Jim Rainey would draw this kind of crowd, you know, and, uh, but of course he would. So it's a great breakfast, but I do want to point out, for those of you who missed physical fitness, a little PT this morning, there's donuts on the table as well. Just add a little insult there. And chocolate covered, I might add as well. But uh, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, very excited. We're going to start off uh, General Rainey will give a, a opening remarks, and then we'll go to the fireside chat, and we'll have take as many questions as possible. Start thinking of your questions, what uh, what you want to ask General Rainey, and we'll get to as many as possible. I'm not going to cover his entire bio as I introduce him to save time, but I'm going to cover the, the key parts. You'll see what a fantastic fit he is for this critical command. Uh, he started off. Uh, I'm going to point out at uh, Eastern Kentucky University, 1987 grad, a swimmer. I thought he was a football player, but uh, he kind of swam like a football player, I think, is what, but uh, uh, for the colonels there, Eastern Kentucky colonels. But uh, he started up, he had served in the 75th Ranger Regiment. He was the uh, long range surveillance detachment in the 1st Cavalry. And he started to see uh, commands in Iraq, for example, commanded uh, Task Force 27 Cav in Iraq, and then a uh, 3rd Brigade Combat Team of uh, 4th Infantry Division in Iraq as well, so both battalion and brigade command. He was director of the Mission Command Center of Excellence, going over to the institutional side, the TRADOC there, and, and then uh, Deputy Commanding General, 4th Infantry Division. Uh, and then uh, in that job, he was in Afghanistan, Regional Command South, as well as uh, a place where I worked with him a bunch. He was a Chief of Infantry, uh, the Infantry Commandant, the Maneuver Center of Excellence. And again, great experience. Then commanded 3rd Infantry Division, and in that uh, role, uh, commanded Joint Task Force 3, in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, and uh, an amazing job there. He went on to the Combined Arms Center, CAC, uh, and uh, again, you can see the trend here, operational and institutional, back and forth, amazing uh, experience, again, for, for where he's at now. And then uh, had multiple uh, key staff jobs, but I think the last one came from G357, a fairly easy job there, uh, not, not real busy in the Pentagon uh, uh, prior to assuming uh, Futures Command. So. We're just great to have him here. Look forward to the discussion. So without further ado, please welcome General Rain. All right. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, uh, for coming out this morning. Um, as the, it's funny, my last job, nobody ever wanted to talk to me. You know, me, and, me and Pat work over there, and Patrick Madlock, he took my place. Huge upgrade. Good to see you, Pat. Uh, nobody wants to hear from the G357 because there's this pain coming through the phone or something. Uh, 
So I'm assuming everybody's here not to see me, to just to hear about the, the great organization that is uh, Army Futures Command, what we're thinking. And I just want to start with a couple opening comments. But first of all, let me, let me thank everybody here who has, uh, has served, who, who took a turn on the wall, put on the uniform, served selflessly. Um, most of you in this room either are responsible for me being here because I work for you or with you or teammates of mine uh, or you know Greg and I commanded battalions together there's some there's some heroes in the room here and I just want to start with that and ask everybody um, you know get out there and inspire young men and women to serve their country you know tell your story you know the army's army's kept America free put it on its feet kept it there but it's also, you know, a leadership factory for our country, you know, uh, and it's it's I believe the the single biggest vehicle for social change. You know, you can be anything you want to be if you join our team, measure up to our standards, live our values. You can you can change your family generationally instantly. You wake up every day feeling good about what you did and go to bed every night with a clean conscience. You know, whatever your version of that is, because none of this is going to matter if we don't maintain an all volunteer force and continue, you know, and there's a bunch of studies and everything else. The bottom line, I joined the army because every person I respected in my neighborhood had one thing in common. They all had served. Right. My coach, my youth pastor. I mean, every person I said, hey, I want to be like that was was a veteran. So thank you all, first and foremost, for, for everything you've done for the country, because us in uniform are standing on the shoulders of those who went before us. And I, I mean that. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, AFC, Army Futures Command, uh, great organization. I banned anybody from talking about standing up AFC. We're stood up. We're one of four ACOMs. AFC indisputably was a bold and necessary decision. I fully support that. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have taken command if I didn't believe that. One of four ACOMs. I got three great teammates, a little Army ACOM fire team, right? General General Pappas, General Daly, and, and General Brito. So we all work together. But the first thing I wanted to do, and then I'll take some questions, is just take a minute and talk about why what afc does what our purpose is because there if i'm honest as i took over there's a little bit of confusion inside afc outside afc you know and i just want to lay that flat for everybody indisputably so if i could, if i can get that one slide and it's really it's really pretty simple um the purpose of afc why we exist is to transform our army to ensure war winning future readiness. That's it. That's our why. That's what we do. Transform the army. I'm accountable for that. AFC is accountable for that. General Pappas does current readiness, generates the lethal men and women that go out and meet combatant commanders near term requirements. General Brito builds people, builds the leaders, trains them rights doctrine everybody knows trade doc's critical role general daly and his team keep the whole thing running from the, from the rifle squad to the industrial base and afc's piece of that is transformation okay modernization is important modernization is part of transformation but modernizing and not transforming is going to end up with a bunch of kit without the right leaders, without trained units, without formational lethality. So transformation is bigger and more ambitious. And the future readiness, war winning future readiness. So we have an army, number one, to deter people, right? Nobody wants to fight a war with China or, you know, anybody who's fought doesn't want to do it, right? So we're deter them. And if we can't determine, deter them, the United States Army is the part of the joint force that is accountable for dominating the land domain anywhere against anybody as part of a joint force with partners, right? So war winning future readiness, transformation. We're the best army in the world today 
And AFC's piece of the team is to make sure we're the best Army in 2030 and the best Army in 2040 and every, every day between now and then. So I set three priorities. Number one is our people, right? Because um, you, you've all been in leadership positions. You can't do anything without people. And, it, and there's a competition out there for talent. And AFC is small by design, so we need, we need the best people. DA civilians, 88% civilian organization. So we, we, we ride on the back. We bring uniformed people in for combat currency and relevance. But, but we, we ride on the back of our great DA civilian workforce. Recruiting and retaining talent. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of people, so if you're coming to AFC and you want to be on the team, I know there's some people out there listening in the marketplace, but hey, we need the best. You need to either be really good at fighting, combat, experience, war fighting, and leadership, or you need to be a deep technical expert in, in one of the many complex fields. So we're out there fighting for talent. <clears throat> and then the, the Army campaign plan, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff have tasked us to do two big things, deliver the Army of 2030 and design the Army of 2040. And I have shifted the main effort of AFC to 2040. We got to get out further. Um, there's a natural sucking sound back to the left of current ops, acquisition, modernization. I'm talking about transformation. We, we need to outthink the Chinese, boldly maneuver ahead of them, grab some ground and anchor it so they wake up trying to figure out how they're going to keep up with us. And I think, you know, that's well within our capabilities as an institution. So 2040, more emphasis, you know, we can't stop talking about 2030, but 2030 is in a good place. We've got a good NDS. We've got an NMS. We've got a joint warfighting concept. The Army's got a phenomenal plan uh, to deliver the Army 2030 across all the DOTMO PFP. So delivering that, and it's interesting because if you're the AFC, uh, if you took DOTMO PFP, uh, AFC doesn't own any one of those things, right? So the other teammates are doing it. General Daly's got facilities, Gary Brito, TRADOC, everybody knows what they do. They've got the weight of the effort, people plus doctrine, organizations, training, leader development. <clears throat> but accountability is one of the four ACOMs. The chief and secretary put that on AFC. Synchronize all that deliver an MDO capable army by, by 2030. And I can talk about that more if anybody's interested. But the thing I'm really excited about is, is figuring out what, cause really not, not a lot is gonna change between now and 30. We're palming now, we're TAA and now paying attention. The big opportunities is to figure out what the next big evolution of warfare is and deliver formation-based solutions to that right? Capability plus capacity plus getting it in the right place. Uh, I'm really excited about that part of my job. Um, and we do about six big things. The future operating environment, that's AFC's responsibility to the Army. So I'm accountable not just for what the enemy is going to look like in 2040. Uh, we, we've, we've got the best intel people in the world, I think, in the Army, led by General Potter and her team. But it's it's demographics, it's it's uh, geopolitics, you know, describing that operational environment in 2040. And we're not going to get it right, but we can't get it wrong either. And then, so everything, everything we do well in the Army is when we start with the enemy first, right? <clears throat> so let's start with the environment first. And then we do research. We develop concepts. We experiment with them, and we translate them into requirements. AFC does requirements. Mr. Bush, my teammate, uh, who professionally and personally, he and I have a great relationship. I, I worked with him uh, and, and have nothing but respect for him and his team. He is a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed acquisition executive of the Army. ASALT knows what they're doing. My job is to give them requirements that they can translate into solutions and stay, you know, arm in arm with them over the process. It's like having an offense and defense. I'm a Buckeye fan. It's great to score 41 points on Georgia, but if you can't hold a 14 point lead, it doesn't matter, right? So you got to have an offense and a defense, right? So it's a team. I really would would just tell everybody that that uh, 
uh, you got to trust me on this. There, there is no drama with AFC and ASALT. Uh, it's not helpful. It's not helping the army. It's not helping the country. Um, we're moving out, giving way together as a team. That's what the army does. Um, because it's about, it's about integration. That's, that's the thing I think we're missing. Uh, maybe if I'm self-critical of my organization is, is we got a bunch of great things happening across the army. We got material solutions and non-material solutions. There's an opportunity to be more integrated. There's an opportunity to integrate better with industry. I've got huge academic outreach, uh, you know, bringing the power of our university systems to bear has been, you know, if you look at the history of, of our great country, reaching into that academic excellence and bringing it to bear. And I've found nothing but great patriots that are all about helping. You know, they want to solve problems. They, they appreciate the opportunities this country's afforded them. And they want to give back. So integration, integrate in 2030 and 2040, right? Because we don't want to build an army for 2030 and then like, okay, now we got to start on the 2040 thing, right? We want to, we want to do this agilely every year and revisit it. Analytic solutions. So, so the army has the best analysts in the department and we have more of them. Um, and that's not a criticism of anybody else, but, but bringing the analytic capacity of our army to bear to be able to defend positions with data is another place that, that I've asked our team uh, based on some guidance I got from the chief and the secretary, right? Because I said so might work as a parent. It doesn't work in the building and it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work as a parent if you have my kids, but the, uh, you know, that's not a way to win arguments, right? You know, there's art and science in, in our profession and, and we, we need to do better at the science part, proving our arguments. And uh, it's good to see you, Carl. And, and we, we have all the capacity. This is just a, a discipline thing. And the thing I'm really excited about is, is the idea of, of this is really just a campaign. You know, we, we need to have a campaign of continuous learning, right? We got, we got to be better learners, which takes a, a, a curiosity, a passion, an intellectual humility, the ability to learn from other people, to watch something, being able to say like, hey, we might have this wrong, right? So the idea that things like Project Convergence, the real world operations that are going on in Ukraine, um, everything we're doing is an opportunity to learn, strengthen your arguments, strengthen your position, and end up in a better place. So that's all I really wanted to say, opening. And uh, if it's okay with you, sir, we'll, we'll move on to earning my breakfast. <laughs> All right, well, uh, get started right away on questions, and uh, that was a, a great foundation, Jim, and appreciate it. I want to dig into a little bit more uh, the integration, because you know, when you look, uh, I think one of the reasons Futures Command, a uh, key reason came about is a lot of things were stovepiped, and it was very hard. The change was very, very hard. When you look, uh, look back at, uh, as you're talking about, continuous learning and so forth. So can you dig into what are the keys to integration and what have you seen in uh, you know, your time there where we, we had some challenges and then yeah. what's the road ahead? Um, so I've, I've been watching this out at the Combined Arms Center, then as the G357, and now, now at, at uh, AFC. And it's not anybody not doing their job, it's actually the opposite. Are, we are we are having some, you know, you know when you, a lot of war fighters in here, you know, when everybody fights, everybody makes contingency plans for all the bad stuff that can happen. But real serious war fighters, they go into it with like a, a I got the I got the win big con plan. You know, what if what if we have catastrophic success and end up on the objective, and we're green on combat power? You know, who's getting killed next? Though that kind of that's what's happening in army modernization in a lot of ways. Right. So we stood up AFC. We built CFTs, which is 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 like just pouring gat. I mean, that's a small accelerant of the M part of modernization. And uh, and, and I would defer to Mr. Bush on the on the details of any specific <clears throat> program. But indisputably, things are going really well. Probably, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for the chief or anybody, probably better than we anticipated. 
you know. So when that happens, uh, great general, <laughs> Sergeant Major Daly, I'll use a PT analogy. So we got a bunch of six minute milers, you know, as so we're taking the company out on a PT test and the M guys are running the six minute mile and, uh, and we got some eight minute milers, which I, I kind of fall in that category at this point. That's in my all right. Life. I'm at 10 minutes now. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, for two miles. So. But yeah, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, we might have a 12 minute mile or two out there. Somebody might be, somebody might be tying their shoe, you know, or something like that. So if you look across Dotmo PFP, we got some catching up to do. And some of it's hard facilities, you know, so you put a great capability in a formation, you know, it, it, that's great, but they got to have somewhere to shoot it. And our great sustainers, you know, they've proven they can, they can sustain army equipment in a dust storm, but we don't want to operate like that on a daily basis. Right. So we got a facility catch up here and there. The, the thing that General Brito and I, not, you know, it's him not speaking for him, but but the thing that's probably the biggest thing is is we're going to have to build new MOSs, new new skill identifiers. Uh, there there are clearly some skill sets that we're going to need. We need now, and we're going to need for sure in the future that we don't even have in the Army. So that takes time. So uh, my number one integration thing is taking the material success because there's no, this isn't like a morale run. We're not, we're not circling back to pick up the slow kids. <laughs> you know, there's no FMTV coming to pick up the fallouts, right? The chief ain't stopping. The secretary's not stopping. So we got to catch everybody up and that's not a bad thing. And we got it well in hand, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So integration right. across Dotmo PFP for delivering the army of 2030. Right. That's, that's, you know, that's the thing, because we're going to put materials into the formation starting this year. And whether it's material showing up or genuine capability in a formation is what's at issue for all of us. Um, uh, the G357 of the Army kind of does that mm -hmm. uh, for the Army and, and the four ACOM commanders are accountable. Um, going out a little further, I think it's it's doing a better job of of integrating those those six things mm -hmm. you know integrating a, a clear understanding of the operating environment we do great experimentation we're writing a new army operating concept mm -hmm. that's that's probably the most important thing that afc is doing um more to follow on that um and again we got incredible talent and great teammates working on that but we got to come up with a concept translate that to require what we mm -hmm. think we need across Dotmo PFP, go out, experiment, confirm the, what we need, write good requirement documents, not just material requirements, but mm -hmm. we got to tell General Brito and his team, hey, we got to build these kind of leaders. You know, this is, what does an MDO, what does an MDO range look like? You know, you, you guys all dealt with the great range control guys in the world, <laughs> uh, trying to get them to let you do a platoon live fire at night, tell them you want to drop munitions from a quadcopter and ask them they'll they'll you'll need the paddles you know to, to resuscitate <laughs> so we and that's that's a very simple the buffalo soldier range out of Wachuca. i mean fascinating capacity and capability innovation those kind of things mm -hmm. and then and then how do we man it with the men and women that have always made us you know, our asymmetric advantage is people mm -hmm. it's always going to be people so we got to man it we got to sustain it we got to retain it um so other than that i got it i got it all it's easy yeah yeah, yeah well yes, it's, it's a great analogy on the on the the, the uh, pace uh how about i've heard you use the term formation based requirements right what are what are you getting at there and how does that <laughs> impact yeah uh haven't figured it out totally yet but 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 uh, so if everybody bears with me uh, we we in the in the army have a process to acquire things, right? It's a reality, I'm, I'm not naive. I don't think that's gonna change. We buy helicopters, we buy vehicles, we buy radios, we buy weapons, right? We buy things, but we don't fight things. We fight formations. So I'm not saying that we're gonna come up with a new requirements document for a rifle platoon or a tank company. It's more a way of thinking, sir. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't want to replace a tank with a tank mm -hmm. per se, right? 
we got a tank company that has this many stowed kills that takes this much gas on this schedule that weighs this much that takes this many incredibly talented young men and women mm -hmm. right what's another way where i can get that many stowed kills more lethality more survivability more deployability mm -hmm. right so i don't think i don't think there's a if, if i don't we don't want to just replace weapons with weapons mm -hmm. we, we want to build more lethal formations that makes sense and so i think if we talk that way and I, i'm an optimist I, I i i've gotten pretty steady 100 days worth of if we talk to industry about problems we're trying to solve challenges mm -hmm. we face right as opposed to you know peer requirement mm -hmm. document and this is an acquisition i'm talking afc right 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 uh i think there's a huge opportunity to bring to bear the innovation that's happening in some you know some of these smaller companies the experience uh, and capacity that resides in some of the bigger right mm -hmm. you know the picatinny rail if anybody's familiar with this with the m4 so when i was when i was a battalion commander uh we were trying to figure everything out and they started sending us all this great stuff to to put on your rifle right and and except for you know you're wiring it taping it zip tying it and somebody said hey here's a rail we're up for anything you want to send us just make sure it fits this rail so what's the equivalent of that analogy for a robot mm -hmm. you know how, how can i go out and say hey if you can operate on this software if you're hardened against these threats and it physically fits on this uav robot whatever and just just turn the you know turn the mm -hmm. the energy of the united states uh to bear uh, th that that that's yeah, kind of sense. not real clear. I'll, I'll get better at this. No, it makes I, sense. I still yeah, think they, working my way through uh, it. Yeah. Uh, well, anybody who's dealt with the uh, you know, modernization, that you can exactly what you're talking about. The, the formation base right. makes sense. It's not the pieces and parts. It's right. going to be the total, no doubt about it. Now, another thing that's changed significantly is, you know, the ideas used to come from within the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. And then they would migrate outside. And now we know the ideas come from industry and the small businesses you were yeah. talking about and, and great industry leaders out here. How does futures come in? How do you get those ideas now? Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges. But what has futures command done to make that easier to, to integrate that flip of the system, if you will, which we were all struggling with before so, futures come in? Yes. Yeah. So I'm I'm new and not a criticism of anybody or anything. I think I've gotten pretty steady feedback that we could do a better job of iterating and providing feedback and opportunities mm -hmm. to collaborate. Um, we've gone out and in, in fairness, we've gone out and asked industry to do something. They've brought it to us. We've been slow to provide feedback. So that's, you know, talks cheap, but that's something I'm committed to, to doing a little better. Uh, where I thought you were going, that is the innovation that's happening inside the formations. Yeah. That's yeah. what's really, you know, like the you know, software so, factory. Well, in, in software factory inside that's, that's an AFC innovation thing. Yeah. Uh, phenomenal. We don't know what we're going to do, but we indisputably know we need, you know, we need, <laughs> we need to up our data game. Right. right? So the right. fact that you go out to 1.2 million person army, there are people that can probably do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I was in, in a situation and uh, I said, you know, I, I went to my platoon sergeant and said, Hey, we need somebody that can hotwire a car and somebody that can drive a bulldozer. And he's like, you know, I mean, a rifle in any rifle platoon, you can find a human that can play the trumpet, <laughs> steal. Some, I mean, there's no. Sh so yeah. so that the, General Murray's brilliant idea was that before we go out and pay and buy a bunch yeah. of data, let's find out what we can do inside the army. So the software factory and then also at that little higher end, what's going on at Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we found we got a lot of a lot of talent in the army. Uh, to translate that, but what I was talking about is is the closer you are to the getting shot part of the army, mm -hmm. the better you are at innovate. No doubt, that's the yeah. observation I have. Yeah, uh, you know, the hedgerow, the famous like hedgerow story, right. was an E six from Chicago who was a heavy equipment operator, Sergeant Cohen, and yeah, yeah and the difference between him and everybody else was he was going to get killed, him and his teammates, if they didn't figure it out. So he got a blowtorch. The rest is history, right? Mm -hmm. When we were in World War II. So that's happening all over the place in the Army. So the soldier touch points get, you know, as we go through an, an acquisition effort or a modernization effort or a transformation effort, more touch points. And then uh, I just was at Scarlet Dragon last week down at 18th Airborne Corps. 
right? I'm, I, I don't care who, I, I'm less interested in role, who has what roles and authorities. What I'm interested in is who's got the best ideas, Yeah. right? Because because if you don't care about who's doing what, you just care about the Constitution and 18-year-old men and women, we, mm -hmm. we're going to figure this out. But there's great innovation happening all over the Army. Now, at the same time, you know, you can't be so open-minded, your brains fall out. So if, if, if we got... We can't have everybody making their own rifle platoon. You know, at right. some point in time, right. me and Brito and Papa's got to kind of, okay, you know, here's here's what we're going to look like. You mm -hmm. know, we got MTOs for a reason. So uh, there's a little bit of that, but but I'm, I I think there's I think the people that are going to figure it out are the men and women that are that are leading formations right now. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and and uh, as you mentioned, I think you know what's unique with, with Sergeant Cullen. What other army would that idea have come from? that he's six on the beach in Normandy and made it all the way up across the entire formation yeah. to cut through those hedgerows and, uh, you know, and be successful. And it's the same challenge today. How yeah. do you, you know, that environment where you mission yeah. command and empowerment where they can, they can get at that level. Yeah. And, but, the, you know, and, you know, the NCO corps, the, well, that's the secret sauce. Yeah, that's what exactly. wants. People buy our, our kit. They really, they can't buy our NCO corps. That's what everybody right. would buy if they could. Right. Let's go to questions from the audience. Uh, hi, Ashley Roki with James. Um, hi, General. Or sorry, breaking defense. <laughs> Um, you mentioned, you mentioned Ukraine and requirements. Could you give us some solid examples of how you're either taking, you know, lessons learned from Ukraine or potentially what's coming out of China and within the AFC, um, you know, working it and potentially tweaking either requirements of larger programs or subsystems? Yeah. Um, with a bunch of caveats, the, uh, so people ask, what are we learning from Ukraine? I, I think we are observing a lot of things to say that we're learning something less than a year into to this. I, I would be a little, I'd be a little concerned of anybody making a definitive statement based on what is a really unique and complex, but there are clearly observations. Um, and I'll get to your specific question, but, but a couple, um, what hasn't changed, right? So I think there's pretty clear evidence that humans still matter, that the war is still a contest of will between human beings, um, which is good if you're the United States Army because that's our biggest strength, right? Um, almost, it, it would be hard to convince me that, that land isn't still the decisive domain, right? By watching this. Yeah, all the domains matter. We're a joint force. We can't win without everybody. But 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 this idea that land's not important is is you know you, you'd have a hard time linking that to anything that's actually happening in this horrific war and human suffering because that's where all the people live. Uh, so that hasn't changed. What has changed, uh, and we were kind of seeing this, uh, but it, it's just getting coming out in spades. The biggest thing is is this is we are going to operate under constant observation and in constant contact. That is a big change. Uh, we, we all grew up talking about IV lines and probable lines of contact. That that's that's kind of irrelevant. The enemy is going to be able to see us, uh, and and we may not be in direct fire or indirect fire, but we are going to be in continuous contact from some domain across you know electromagnetic so it, some some contact. So as we talk about requirements, um, I, I I don't think we're going to be building big talks and BSAs and aviation assembly areas um, if you can't protect them. So the 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 protection warfighting function, um, the fires warfighting function, and how do you raise lethality if the primary limitation you have is you can't survive on the battlefield if you hold still, right? So uh, that needs to translate into every every modernization effort, but more importantly into our tactics and doctrine. Um, we 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 have to be able to project combat power uh and and it's not just moving our heavy stuff you know how do how do we take our heavy stuff make it more make it lighter without giving up lethality so that we can strategically deploy it 
at speed and scale. I think there's a huge opportunity to increase the lethality and survivability of our light formations, you know, so that so that you you don't have to move 91 ton things around. You can you can you can vertically envelop leverage the strength of our light combined arms teams. You know, BCTs still matter. Take a piece of terrain and kill see and kill at a range that we used to only be able to do in our heavy formations. So, so those are those are things. The other thing is urbanization. You know, ten years ago we were talking about urbanization. We kind of haven't been talking about it a whole lot. I mean, ur urban warfare is unavoidable and decisive going forward. So, uh, and, and, and the capability to you know, it's the irony is what is always been thought of and still is the most dangerous place might be the safest place on the future battlefield. So how do you wrap your head around that? So I don't, I don't know if any of that's helpful. Sir, thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, this morning. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Colonel Peter Nieuwenhuis. I'm the military attaché from the Netherlands. Uh, can you elaborate a little more on partner cooperation in project convergence? Uh, we're having some difficulties to getting in. and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, in your 100 days letter, there was not much mentioned about uh, partners. So, can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, yeah. Um, so, there aren't a few certainties about the future, one of which is we're going to fight with our great partners and allies. I'm certain of that. Uh, and, and General McConville and our secretary are, are adamant about that. Project convergence is one of a bunch of ways that we work with partners and allies. Um, we started small. We did U.S. only. Really, we did Army only. Then we did U.S. joint. Then we did a little bit of partner stuff. Uh, the last time we had partners that were involved and partners that came and observed. We're in the process of uh, working the next capstone event. And the chief has given me guidance to integrate partners to the extent possible. There's some physics, you know, there's, there's a cost. You can't, you know, it's not a show up on Friday, do it on Monday. It takes about a year. You got to make your stuff work on the network, which most people can't, but uh, I, I'd be glad to follow up with you on that. But it's clearly within my, my boss's intent to integrate partners to the extent possible. One thing about Project Convergence you can help me with, everybody thinks it's like one big thing every 12 to 18 months. Project Convergence is a persistent experimentation effort, right? We, I, we, can't, we can't learn stuff every 12 months, right? So we do the big capstone things, but, but, but we also embed learning objectives and AFC teammates. We were down at Scarlet Dragon. So, so the great exercises, the stuff we spend money and time on, that candidly is the best place to learn because that's where our best commanders are. So getting out into core warfighters, the exercise program, Pacific Pathways, the the stuff General Kaboli and, and General Kolosheski, because they're still running, you know, the great aggressive NATO-based exercise program. Um, it was down in Tampa working with General Corilla. You know, if you want to experiment somewhere, the place where the where the live ammo is whipping around is a pretty good place to learn, right? So uh persistent experimentation of project convergence i think you're talking about the capstone events where we come up and do a, a big thing which we haven't even picked the date of the next one uh it won't be this year you know no earlier than spring of 24 but it takes about a year and most of the partners that we tried to integrate could not get their stuff through the cj cell and the security classifications authority to operate so we got to get after it if that's what we're going to do General Matlock would be glad to follow up with you. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your excellent uh, speech and thought to us this morning. Um, I'm Charles Rong, working at the U.S. Army Research Laboratory. In your um, last month's letter to AFC workforce, you excellently outlined uh, our um, um, purpose, priorities, and uh, um, functions. Um, in terms of um, Design Army 2040. I wonder, would you please uh, tell us about your thought about the processes, how we best accomplish this objective? Yeah. 
Uh, easy question. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he works for me. I, know. <laughs> I didn't plant. I didn't plant that yeah, one. You got to plant. Do a little better job. It would have been a softball. <laughs> yeah. And so, so um, we've been doing some work on 2040, the concept. So everything starts with a good concept. But uh, I've kind of slowed down a little bit. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world, so it's it's not uh, General Steph Ahern. If anybody knows her, we talk about brilliant, phenomenal. She leads that. Scott McKean, Lieutenant General McKean at Future Concept does it for us. I think we got a little bit of time to slow down a little bit and make sure that we've got the assumptions right. Uh, my, my experience, if you start with the enemy and you get your assumptions right, then the rest is, you know, you just, you just, you just chopping wood from there. It's just, just hard work. So I, I'm real interested in what, what are the, what are the things that are not going to change? Cause I like to control for the known. I think we don't do that. Well, what's not going to change what is going to change and what are the implications of that that will get us to the way we we need to fight in the future and and that'll translate into uh concept required capabilities is the is the proceed is the term of art where we can then go out to our teammates inside the army in the joint force to industry uh <clears throat> to Congress that we're accountable to and say, hey, here are the things we're going to need to be able to do in 2040. And that some of them will be things we can do and we'll go after them aggressively. And some of them will be things that we can't do yet. And we'll go after them from the S&T research and say, hey, by 2040, we need to be able to, to do this and uh, continue to refine those requirements. 24, everybody's eyes glaze over when I say 2040, especially our great industry partners. But, you know, if you're done in 2040, that means you're you're fielding it in 35, which means you're better be bending metal in 30. We're palming through 29 and TAA and for 30. So I know I said slow down, but I meant a little bit. Not, I mean, we, we, got, a, <laughs> we got a sense of urgency uh, and it's a huge opportunity. I mean, right now, now's the time to get this. Nobody knows what shot clock China's on. Right. Russia is not going away. You can make a good argument. They're more dangerous uh, than they've ever been. But, but we're, we're, we're probably at a period where we can accept some risk for a short period of time to, to make some bold decisions. But we got to get it right or we got to get it 70 percent right and be able to recover for wrong. So thanks for that question. General, thank you so much for being with us today. One of your priorities is the Army network, but we know it's really the data that flows on that transport layer that's so very important. Could you comment on how you're working or not working with the Army CIO in G6 regarding making data more what they call vaultus, visible, accessible, understandable, et cetera? It's so all about the data. So what is your perspective? And I know you're doing perhaps some of this with yeah. your software factory, but beyond the network transport layer, what about all the rest of the information technology stack? Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a great answer for that question. Just to be mm -hmm. honest with you, we're, we're still figuring out a lot of really hard problems. Um, and, and AFC is part of that, but it's really an army, army led the, the vice and the under are going through a portfolio review of all things network and data. Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid your question. I mean, it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, what I'm into is, you know, can we make it work? Can we protect it in a realistic fight? Can we afford it? Can we field it? You know, can we can we put because there's a limit to how how advanced you can get because you have, not because our soldiers can't do it, but they got a lot of other stuff they're going on. So the trainability, usability, and then can you sustain it again in realistic combat? So as I'm looking at all things network, which really I don't even like that term. We're talking about the command and control, the requirement to command and control forces in combat the mission command war fighting function, the sum of things that it takes to do that realistically based on fighting China, right? So, so that's, that's the graduate level work. 
The good news is we have no shortage of brilliant people in and out of uniform that'll figure out what data needs to move where. You know, we just we've got some initial insights from Project Convergence, the last last big evolution. There's some easy things to fix. There's some hard things to fix. Um, you know, algorithmic warfare, data centric warfare is is a big part of the future. So are tank platoons that can that can kill at a ten to one to ten to one ratio. Rifle squads, you know, no matter what the future looks like, some rifle squad of men and women is going to have to close the last hundred meters in the middle of the night. Uh, so I don't want to go down the future of war is algorithmic data precision munitions. That's a big part of it, but uh, we got to deliver an army that can absolutely dominate. And a big part of that is the commanders being able to execute command and control. So not a good answer, but, but I appreciate the question. Hi, Meredith Roten Janes. I was wanting to ask about in terms of there's been a lot of concern about bolstering supply chains uh, for the army and especially with the conflict in Ukraine. And I was wondering how that concern is affecting your modernization priorities and how you're thinking about moving your objectives forward. Yeah, Thank you. that's great. So back to the observations and, and so what, what what is striking to me is that Developing capability is important, but you have to have capacity. <laughs> so it we we we're pretty good, and we've got to put a lot of energy into new adding new capability. What I've observed recently is that it, it's some sum of new capability plus capacity plus getting it in the right position. So if you don't do all three, you could come up with the greatest weapon ever. If you if you don't have enough ammo, then you got a problem. And if you have a great weapon and enough ammo, and it's on the wrong side of the IDL, you know you got another problem. So in a in a resource constrained right, like some of the best guidance Secretary Warmoth gave is strategic sustainable path. Right, you you, you get you know the, 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 this is unlimited right. So. Given a, a fiscal reality, how do you decide the right mix of additive capability plus capacity plus the ability to get it in the right place and sustain it uh, to translate that that uh, into deterrence? And if you have to, to be able to win a fight. So that, that that's how it's shaping my thinking about the future. The defense industrial base, stuff like that, I I, I, I mean, uh, Mr. Bush is, is, is leading that effort. General Daly, they're better qualified to, to talk specifics of that, but it's, it's absolutely a priority. We got the best people we got in, in and out of uniform working on it right now. Sir, we have uh, one more question from the audience and then we'll turn it back over to General Brown. All right. Hi, Jen Judson with Defense News. Um, I wanted to ask, where do you see project convergence going generally? How, what do you see being the evolution of this type of experimentation um, over time? And then how much will this inform the design of 2040 versus validating uh, what your plans are to deliver in 2030 uh, at Project Convergence? Yeah, thanks. So again, persistent experimentation, that, that's what we got to do. We can't, we can't wait 12 to 18 months to do a big expensive exercise. Um, we need to do that at the right point in time. And, and I've got another 30 days before I owe the chief and secretary an answer on when I think we should do the next one and the scope and scale of it. So it's then the potential is unlimited. I mean, Project Convergence is an army hosted joint experiment with partners. So uh, some, well, yeah. So anyways, the potential is unlimited. Um, we had great teammates from the joint staff and OSD out at the last one. I defer to them, but the potential to make it more joint uh, and, and use project convergence as the place where the joint force comes together to, to validate uh, JADC2, which is, is an essential effort 
So that's kind of inside 2030. That stuff, if we go to war tonight, we got to be able to do better. So there's that aspect, but it's absolutely fascinating uh, on what we're seeing and the potential. If you So you see something and say, hey, we're not going to make that work. That's too complicated in two years. I'm fascinated by it because if it's a great idea and you start talking about, you know, 31, 32, 33, that creates opportunities for us to, to kick it into R&D, S&T, um, go out to industry and, 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 and uh, partner with some folks that are willing to take a little long term view of solutions. So it's both. You know, I, t I told General McKean and there's a, a, I won't go into it because it's there's a specific example of we saw something and said we need to do this right now and that's happening directed requirement we're we're trying to solve that indisputably there's other things that we're really really concerned about that we know we need to be able to do that we that are technologically impossible right now and we got to decide in the next year or two whether we think we can do that in the out years and either spend a bunch of money or not and it's probably going to fundamentally affect the way we fight so yes is the answer <laughs> Jim, any uh, thing you didn't get to cover or closing remarks? No, you know? that was way more than I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about a big hand for General Rainey? Well, th again, thanks so much for joining us this morning. There's some events coming up. I want to highlight uh, 14 February, uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, will be here. Always tremendous. Uh, presentations and uh, and really uh, great discussion. That's uh, on the 14th, the coffee series in the morning again. 23 February, we'll have an aviation hot topic. And uh, we've been waiting for that for quite a while. That'll be a great one on 23 February. And then as mentioned a couple times here, uh, Global Force is back. Uh, we had, uh, last time we were there was 2019 and uh, I was still on active duty, you know, and, uh, at the last one and uh, it's back and we're very excited, it's sold out down in Huntsville, 28 to 30 March. Don't forget about Global Force. It'd be a great one down there and, uh, and hope to see you there. So again, thanks for joining us this morning. Any questions, any events coming up, you can go to ausa.org or, or to register uh, for an event. And then let me, let me thank our members that are out there. Membership matters. Uh, join the team uh, that uh, helps support a strong army, strong defense uh, for our nation. So uh, thanks for coming and uh, have a great army day. Ooh.